Hi guys, I call this fun with FFTs, or how to learn to stop worrying and love complex exponentials. So here's the idea. We've got these tools. When the only tool you have is a hammer, all your problems start to look like nails. So having more tools than one gives you more than one way to see a problem. So it is possible to solve a lot of problems without complex exponentials, but that doesn't mean using a complex exponential should be avoided because it's another way to solve the problem and sometimes it makes it a lot easier. So what are my main points? Complex exponentials are a little bit scary and abstract at the beginning, but they are easy to visualize as phasers. And once you're used to them, they're not so terrible. So it just takes time, it takes some practice. I also want to point out what a great language Python is for dealing with complex math and complex exponentials in particular. Some folks may find that using a familiar computer language is more comfortable than a much less familiar and much more abstract mathematics. So doing computing projects is one way to get used to the dealing with complex exponentials and uh, Python is a great language to use to do that. And the Fourier transform is a tool that you can use for a variety of different purposes, but that in order to understand what it means and how it works really, you need to have a pretty good understanding of, of complex numbers. Okay, so the main point is we've got Euler's formula, which says that e to the i theta is the same thing as cosine theta plus i times the sine of theta. You can show this by doing the uh, Taylor expansion of e to the i theta and the Taylor expansion of cosine and sine and show that those Taylor expansions add up to the same thing. But the way you think about it is that e to the i theta is a complex number that has a real part and an imaginary part. The real part is cosine theta and the imaginary part is the sine of theta. You can see that looking at the expression for Euler's formula, but you can also see it from the geometry I've drawn on the board there. So you can think of a complex exponential as a phasor that makes an angle theta with respect to the real axis, and it looks a little bit like a vector, and the real part is a little bit like an x component, and the imaginary part is a little bit like a y component. The other thing you can do is say, well, what happens if I have a phasor whose phase angle, theta, is a function of time. So now instead of theta, you got omega t. So omega t is a linearly, uniformly increasing uh, phase angle. And uh, so what you would imagine is that the phasor is now going to spin about the real and imaginary, uh, in the real and imaginary plane, in the complex plane, it's going to spin around. So it might end up looking something like this. <coughs> That's a little goofy. I think there's something going on with my uh, animation, but maybe you get the idea. How does complex exponential math work, complex number math? It's pretty straightforward. Basically, complex numbers add like vectors. In other words, in, when you're adding vectors, you add the x components together and add the y components together. The sum of the x components is the x component of the resultant. The sum of the y components is the y component of the resultant. Same way with complex numbers. The real parts add and the imaginary parts add. So it's easiest to do this kind of manipulation if the complex number is expressed as a real part plus an imaginary part. Multiplying is a different story. Complex exponentials multiply like any other um, complex number. The magnitudes multiply, but the phase angles add because they show up in the exponent. So if you multiply complex numbers expressed in component form, it gets kind of ugly. It's not as easy to do. But uh, the good news is Python doesn't care. It does complex math directly. If you define x to be 3 plus 4j and y to be 6 plus 8j, and you add x and y together, it does the right thing. It gives you 9 plus 12j. Notice also mathematicians have used i historically to mean the square root of negative 1. But in Python, they chose to use j 
because there are engineers in the mix in the decision making process and of course engineers use J because I already means current so anyway uh, the J is the way you create a complex number in Python what I sometimes do is I define a variable called I which happens to be equal to J <laughs> and then I use I but uh, whatever um, you can you can do it either way if you ask what is the magnitude of X it's 5 if you ask what's the magnitude of Y it's 10 and the magnitude of X times Y is 50 so uh, it, do it does the right thing and also it has this notion of conjugation uh, the conjugate of y times x is 50 plus j. Um, notice that x is a phasor that uh, it's a 3, 4, 5 triangle kind of and y is proportional to x except it, it, uh, it's twice as long but then y conjugate is going to be reflected about the real axis and so when you multiply them together the angles add to zero. So anyway, you can see that uh, these guys behave about the way you'd expect. Also, you can make functions that create uh, complex exponentials. Here's a simple function that creates a complex exponential with an amplitude and a phase, and it returns a complex number that has the right amplitude and phase. So it's, it's dead easy. Here's an example. You, that illustrates the idea of using complex exponentials in a real case. It's the uh, coupled simple harmonic oscillator. So you imagine you have four masses connected together by springs and the springs are tied to walls. So basically you could imagine that there are infinite masses at the ends and then finite masses in the middle. The force on a particular spring is related to the position of that spring that mass relative to the previous mass and relative to the next mass so xn minus xn minus 1 is the stretch of the spring between the n and n minus 1th mass and xn plus 1 minus xn is the stretch of the spring between the n plus 1 and the nth mass and of course the spring constant k tells you how much force you get per unit compression or stretch and uh, that's going to be equal to the mass of the nth, nth mass times its acceleration. One way to attack a problem like this is to propose that um, each of the masses executes some kind of simple harmonic motion. And uh, you can recast the force equations into a matrix form that looks something like this. And then the question is, what are the values of x0, x1, x2, and x3 that satisfy the requirement that they all behave harmonically? And uh, the answer is, there are certain normal modes. Let's look at them. The lowest frequency mode is going to look something like this. This is the uh, sort of sloshing mode, where notice the two masses at the end are stationary, but the masses in the middle slosh back and forth. Then there's another mode where uh, this is a, like a breathing mode where the right-hand two masses go one way and the left-hand two masses go another way. Then there's a, another mode where um, the right-hand two masses and the left-hand two masses execute opposite. Or you could say the two in the middle are going together and the two on the outside are going opposite. And then there's the last frequency mode where each neighbor is going opposite its nearest neighbor. So that would be the fourth mode. Now, one way to solve this, if you notice that the matrix equation that we ended up with was actually an eigenvalue problem, so you could uh, create an array with all those uh, k values in there and uh, find the eigenvalues of that matrix and it'll print out the eigenvalues and you can also get the eigenvectors but these numbers seem a little random they don't <coughs> they don't jump out at you as being obviously correct the question is is there any other way to think about the problem that uh, that might be more intuitive and the answer is yeah 
So the idea is that we can use phasors to solve this problem in a little bit different way with complex exponentials and complex numbers. It's the same problem, it's the same force equation, but this time we're going to look for a solution in which the x's are complex now. In reality, of course, if you measure the displacement of a mass, it's going to be real. So at the end, when we're done with the math, we can say, well, let's uh, demand <coughs> that the displacements just be the real part of whatever solution we get. But if we allow the x's to be complex, it turns out it gives us a way to find an algebraic solution without having to use eigenvalues and eigenvectors and, and linear algebra. So here's the plan. You make a guess that the displacement of the nth mass is some number c to the nth power times e to the i omega t. What we're going to end up saying is that let's let make sure c is just a pure phase. It's a complex number with a magnitude of 1. What that means is the amplitude of the uh, displacement of the successive masses doesn't go up or down as you move along the chain. And see what happens. So if you take the second derivative with respect to time, you get a minus omega squared. We, we're going to demand that the magnitude of the complex number be 1. That means the complex number is e to the i delta, where delta is a small phase angle of some kind. And that means that the displacement of the nth mass is uh, e to the i delta to the nth power. Okay, so what that means is that the phasor that represents the displacement of each mass is going to shift by a certain phase angle. If mass 1 is at a phase angle of 10 degrees, then mass 2 will be at 20, mass 3 will be at 30, mass 4 will be at 40, and so on. The Each mass is going to be at a successively higher uh, relative phase, but they all spin around in the complex plane with the same frequency. That's the idea. If you plug this guess back into the force equation and you solve for omega squared, it turns out the, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you get the answer that omega squared depends on the phase difference between neighboring oscillators, neighboring masses. And uh, when the phase difference is zero, omega is zero. So that means there's no wiggle at all. That would be each mass is displaced by the same amount. But if you make a phase difference between neighboring masses, then, um, then omega is something. And the bigger the phase difference, the bigger omega gets, if you look at the way this thing behaves. So let's look and see what that solution looks like if we run it over some period of time. Basically, what we get is phasors that spin. There's a phase difference. This, is, this example is a negative phase difference. The, um, I'm sorry. Starting on the left, you'll notice that each phasor is slightly more advanced. So this would be a positive uh, e to the plus i delta. But also notice that there's no boundary condition satisfied here. So we've got a correct relationship between the, um, the phase difference between neighboring phasors and the frequency with which the whole chain oscillates. But uh, there's this particular solution that I've drawn here doesn't satisfy any boundary conditions. But how can I satisfy those boundary conditions? Well, you know the superposition principle. If you've got two different solutions to the same problem and you add them together, then the superposition is also a solution. And that's simply because the second derivative with respect to time and taking differences of neighboring displacements uh, are both linear operations. And so I can see what happens if I make a superposition. I want to pick a particular frequency. I want to pick the frequency that corresponds to a phase difference from one end of the chain all the way to the other end of the chain of pi. So that, and let's look and see what happens here. If you look at the top row, you'll notice that when the phasor in the top row is pointing up, and you, the phasor all the way to the right is pointing down. When the phasor on the left is pointing down, the phasor all the way to the right is pointing up, and there's an equal phase difference between each neighboring uh, oscillator. Well, let's see how many phase differences are there. There's one, two, three, four, five. There's five phase differences that have to add up to pi. So that means we're talking about a, del a delta value of pi divided by five. The top row 
um, delta is plus pi divided by 5. The bottom row, notice it's minus pi divided by 5. And if I add those two solutions together, notice the way I've added them, the oscillators at the either end, the left end and the right end, exactly cancel. So you can see now the reason I did it this way, I wanted to cook up a way to satisfy the boundary condition that the mass on the far left and the mass on the far right are stationary. And what that gives us then is a solution for the masses in the middle, which is a superposition of the left going or the uh, advancing and the retreating phase. And uh, you can see how the phasers add up to give you the real part of the displacement in the middle. And you won't be shocked to learn that if you calculate the frequency using this approach, you get, uh, that should be an omega squared, dang it, that's a formula error there, it should be omega squared is equal to all that stuff, but uh, when you calculate the frequency, it comes out right. And then here's an, another example, but this time it's 2 pi divided by 5, but I think you can see that this is the breathing mode. This is the mode uh, n equals 2, I guess, for the masses on the springs. And uh, so you can see how this approach works. So students can become familiar with these phasers in a concrete system like masses on springs. You can also do AC circuits. You can do diffraction. There's other examples of applying these same ideas. Um, <coughs> And as I pointed out, there are different ways to solve the same problem. You can use the eigenvector and eigenvalue approach. That's fairly intense, uh, and it requires appreciation of linear algebra. The nice thing about the complex exponentials is that they, you can get nice pictures to see where the frequencies come from, and, uh, and they're very visual. You can see the phasers adding and up to produce different things. Um, and also, you get to use superposition, which is a fundamental building block of many other in many other areas, and so it's nice to, uh, to get an opportunity to use that. Now let's talk about Fourier transforms. Uh, Fourier transforms are usually introduced as um, complex integrals that take you from a real-time function of time, say, to a complex function of frequency, or a complex function of frequency back to a real function of time, and uh, Implicit in this concept of a Fourier transform is the notion of superposition. <coughs> I can represent one function as a superposition of some other set of functions. The Fourier transform is just using the complex exponentials as uh, a sort of basis set of functions. Now, uh, the problem is Fourier transforms tend to be analytically complicated. So you can look at the mathematics of Fourier transforms and students see that and their eyes kind of gloss over and they get very frightened. So the question is, is there any way to talk about and deal with Fourier transforms using complex exponentials and maybe a different notation? I'm going to talk about the Dirac notation here. So here's the discrete Fourier transform. The idea is we're, we're going to try to understand what's going on in the analytical or the continuous Fourier transform by thinking about the discrete Fourier transform. What's nice about the discrete Fourier transform is that's what ends up being done on computers. Anytime we use computers to calculate Fourier transforms, ultimately it's the discrete Fourier transform that we're getting. And uh, it's defined I in this way. It doesn't actually look a whole lot better. The lowercase f is the function of, it's a function of probably time, or it could be space, but the point is it's a sampled function at definite values of j. So j goes from 1 to, or from 0 to n minus 1, so you have capital N samples, and capital F is the Fourier transform of little f, and, uh, and then on the right there you see the inverse Fourier transform, where you can go from the Fourier transform back to the original function. Both of these are sampled, though. So capital F, has, it, let's start with a simple case of four samples. Uh, capital F has F0, F1, F2, F3. Lowercase f has F0, F1, F2, F3. But uh, looking at those expressions, they don't look a whole lot better than the analytical continuous version. So, but what I want to propose is that you can use a matrix vector representation that makes it a little bit easier to understand. First thing I want to do 
is factor out the k dependence of the complex exponential. So notice it's uh, e to the minus 2 pi over n, which is a phase kind of thing. 2 pi over n is a phase of 2 pi divided by the number of samples. So in this case, if we have four samples, 2 pi over n would be 2 pi divided by 4. Well, that's pi over 2. Of course, if you take 4 pi over 2s, you're back to 2 pi. Um, so it's the phase difference between a phaser and the next phaser if you want to get all the way around to 2 pi in four steps. That's kind of one way to think about it. I'm going to define that thing in parentheses to be alpha. Alpha is the amount of phase from one to the next. Uh, if you think back to the coupled oscillators, it's like the phase difference between neighboring masses. And uh, the idea is that if you take n of these guys, you get around to 2 pi. <coughs> so then we can rewrite the Fourier transform. It looks a little easier now. We basically let j go from 1 to n, and k is a measure of how many of these minimum phase differences are we going per step. So when k is equal to 0, we get uh, no phase difference at all. When k is equal to 1, that means we're going 1, the smallest phaser, the smallest phase change you can get and get around once if you go up to n steps. Uh, if k equals 2, that means we're, we're going around twice in, in n steps. If k equals 3, we're going around three times in n steps, and so on. So you can think of the sampled function as a vector. And here I've changed indices a little bit. I'm calling them f1, f2, f3, f4. You could call them f0, f1, f2, f3, just as well. Um, the point is that the uh, k ket, and this is key, this is like a basis vector in our Fourier space. So the kth basis vector has four elements. It's alpha to the 0, alpha to the k, alpha to the 2k, alpha to the 3k. And so if k is equal to 0, it's just 1s all the way down. If k is equal to 1, it's 1 alpha, alpha squared, alpha cubed. If k is equal to 2, it's 1 alpha squared, alpha to the 4th, alpha to the 6th, and so on. But remember, alpha is a pure phase. So alpha to the 6th is just mean, it just means 2 pi over n times 6, 6 of those angles. <coughs> And the k bra is the same idea, except that the powers are the negatives. And the reason for that is that when you make a bra out of a ket, you've got to take the complex conjugate. And since alpha is uh, complex, it's a pure phase, it gets a sign change. Okay. So, and then what do we mean? What do we get when we take k on f? k on f is a inner product of the basis vector k acting on the time series f. And I want you to see what that is. Basically what it means is you multiply these like a like a matrix. It's a 1 by 4 times a 4 by 1. Mm -hmm. And of course what happens then is you just get the sum of the products of the elements. And uh, that's how you calculate the kth element of the Fourier transform of f. It's just a sum of products of these complex numbers. This is exactly the same f of k as before. There's no difference. Um, and you can think of the, the ket k and the bra k as basis vectors of the Fourier transform and the projection of f onto k. <coughs> so what we've calculated here is the component of f in the k direction. That's the, kind of the way you want to think about it. Um, so let's continue pushing this a little bit and see if we can figure out what's going on. Um, let's imagine writing out the four k vectors, k equals 0, k equals 1, k equals 2, and k equals 3, and uh, then the four bras, which are, again, k equals 0, k equals 1, k equals 2, and k equals 3. And consider what happens when we calculate some things. For example, let's imagine what happens when you calculate the inner product of the jth basis vector and the kth basis vector. 
If you multiply that out, you'll notice that what you get is a sum <coughs> of uh, alpha to the k minus j, alpha to the 2k minus j, alpha to the 3k minus j. Well, what can k minus j be? If k is equal to j, it's always 0. So if k is equal to j, you just get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 4. And you divide by 4, you get 1. But if k is, let's say k is 1 different from j, then you're going to get 1 plus alpha plus alpha squared plus alpha cubed. But notice that alpha is a phasor that's spinning around. And if you add, that f if you add 4 phasors together, each of which is different in phase by pi over 2, you're going to get nothing. So the short story is if k is equal to j, you get 1. If k is not equal to j, you get 0. So what that means is these guys are orthonormal. Um, the basis vectors are orthonormal because if you take the inner product of two basis vectors that are the same, that are the same, you get 1. And if you take different ones, you get 0. Um, but let's talk about this some more. Let's see if we can find a more visual way to represent that. Here's how we represented 0, 1, 2, and 3. What if I think of them as phasors? So a phasor is just an arrow that represents a number. When we have an uh, alpha of e to, the I, e to the minus i pi over 2, then 0 is all phasors pointing to the right. They have, they, they're just 1. They have a real part and no imaginary part. But look at what 1 is. 1 is right, down, left, up. That's because each phasor is advanced by pi over 2. What about the 2 phasor? Well, it's right, left, right, left, because each phasor is 2 alpha, or alpha squared, uh, ahead of the other one. And alpha is e to the i minus pi over 2. And if you square it, you get e to the pi, e to the i pi. So uh, that makes sense. And look at 3. 3, you go 3 pi over 2, but it's clockwise. But notice that 3 pi over 2 clockwise is the same as pi over 2 with a negative. So it's, uh, so 3 is almost like a negative 1. That actually turns out to be important, because in the Fourier transform, the positive frequencies are, are from 0 to n divided by 2, and the negative frequencies are from n back to n divided by 2 plus 1. So the negative frequencies come in on the second half of the discrete Fourier transform array. Um, so let's see how this works in the bra case. It's the same idea, except, of course, the phases are all in the other direction. And then what if I take an uh, inner product? What if I take 1 on 1? Well, I get 1, I get right times right, then I get up times down. But remember how complex numbers multiply. You add the angle. So if you add plus pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, you get 0. That's the same thing as 1. And then the Next two guys, it's minus 1 times minus 1. Well, that's 1. And then it's down times up, but down times up is also 1. So what we have here is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. The, f the uh, phases all add up to 0 when you do the multiplication, and when you add those guys up, you get 1. But uh, what happens, and I forgot I had a graphical representation of that. So what I just said is, is there. Uh, Right times right plus up times down plus left times left plus down times up is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 4. Divided by 4 is 1. What about if we, uh, we have two different numbers, 1 times 1 on 2? So 1, remember, it's the bra, so it goes counterclockwise. And the ket, 2, uh, goes clockwise, but it's going uh, pi each time. And when I multiply those together, let's see what we got. We got right times right, that's 1. Then we've got up times left. Of course, up times left is going to be down. And uh, left, <coughs> left times right is going to be minus 1. And down times left, um, of course, what I mean by down is minus i. And what I mean by up is plus i. So down times left is minus 1 times minus i. That's going to be i. So uh, what does that add up to? It's 1 plus minus i plus minus 1 plus plus i. But that adds up to 0 because uh, it's, uh, if you think about it, it's right plus down plus left plus up. 
And if you add those four phasors together, just like if you add vectors together, you get zero. <coughs> so you can see how the orthonormality comes out um, of the phasors, and it might be a little easier for folks to visualize what's happening if they think about it in terms of phasors. Of course, you can also do this with more if you do it with n equals 8. Um, it's the same thing, except now instead of going pi over 2 each time, you start out with pi over 4. So alpha is now e to the minus i pi over 8, and uh, I didn't say that right. It's e to the minus i 2 pi over 8, or pi over 4. And uh, those are the kets, and of course there are 8 of them. And uh, you also get the corresponding, corresponding bras. So the point is that uh, the Fourier transform you can think of as uh, the component of K on F, and you can think of the inverse Fourier transform as the uh, superposition of the kth component of, of F times the kth ket. So basically, Fourier transforms are just a change of basis. You're just changing from the uh, original basis to a new basis of uh, superpositions of phasers, different phases. That's the idea. Uh, I'll talk to you guys soon.